You're listening to this week's teaching from Ephraim's Light Assembly, July the 30th, 2022. My name is Frank Smith, and I am founder and senior pastor of Ephraim's Light Assembly and Ephraim's Light School of the Bible. We are the called out believers, part of the lost ten tribes called Ephraim, on whom God is calling out and shining his light on in these days just before his return. And that is found in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 16 through 22. The Lord had Ezekiel to declare. Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Take another stick and write on it, for Joseph the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. And our Bible study for this week covers Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 1 through Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 22, and it's named the portion, which is parashah in Hebrew. The name is Davarim. The meaning of Davarim in Hebrew is words, and Davarim in English, of course, is Deuteronomy. Please read Deuteronomy 1 verse 1 to Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 22 in order to participate and understand in this teaching. Okay, so today we enter into a study of the last book of the Torah, Deuteronomy. I'm excited for us, and I look forward to a deep and rewarding study where God reveals more of the mysteries of his word, increases our wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that we understand his character and his kingdom at a deeper level than we ever have before. Our first teaching scripture of the day is Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Prepare your hearts now to receive the word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And our teaching title for this week, In God We Have Not Trusted. I'm excited to bring you this teaching. Today we open with a prophecy that's been right before our eyes, yet it's been hidden from us until now. This prophecy is hidden in the names of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and it is exactly what God is doing in these days. We discover this prophecy by putting together the meaning of the names of the first five books. So we look at Genesis, which is Bereshit in Hebrew, and it means in the beginning. Then there's Exodus, Shemot in Hebrew, and the meaning of Shemot is these are the names. And Leviticus, Virika in Hebrew, meaning of the called out ones. So we who are learning and doing the commandments in the Torah are the called out ones, called out from the world, called out from the false system of government, called out from the false system of religion that has gripped our country, and we are looking for Messiah's kingdom. We are a called out people. We are not a religion. We are a movement of God upon the earth. 
And of course, the last two books of the Torah, Numbers, which is Ba Midbar in Hebrew, and it means in the wilderness. We are symbolically going through a wilderness journey before we enter into the promised land. And finally, Deuteronomy, Davarim in Hebrew, which means these are the words. So what we have in the meaning of the first five books of the Bible is these are the words that he gave us on our journey through the wilderness of this world's false system. These are the words he has given us, the descendants of Israel, and through them we are being prepared to live in his way, to be purified by his words, and drawn near to him. He is preparing us for Mashiach's return when he will write his words on our heart and teach them to us for the next 1,000 years. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And you'll also find that same scripture in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Go look it up. God will write the new covenant on our hearts. So, there is a hidden prophecy in the meanings of the first five books of the Bible. Now, let's put it all together, what we just covered. Here is what God says. In the beginning, these are the names of the called out ones in the wilderness, and these are the words that he gave us in our journey. What an incredible word hidden in the meanings of the first five books of the Bible. Now those who accept Yeshua as Lord and will hearken to the commandments of the Lord, his teaching and his instruction, they will have life. There's a showdown coming between this wicked world system and the righteous government of God. Today the wicked make their plans, plans to lower the living standard of every American by depleting our money with inflation, promoting shortages of food and all essential items through the manipulation of farmers and fertilizer and bringing us into the bondage of their power. In short, they plan to become God for the American people so that we will turn to them for everything, the elite. They promise us prosperity while destroying our freedom and advancing their plans for a one-world government. To fulfill their agenda of having an elite class that rules the entire world, they have to eliminate the middle class because we cannot be allowed to have a higher standard of living than the poorest countries in the world. And we know from Scripture that they will appear to succeed in the short term and the world will be victim to their sinister plans that will make the elite rich and powerful. But in one hour, this Babylon system they're working on will utterly be destroyed. What is beginning to happen today is described in the book of Revelation in the story of the woman and the beast. We go to Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. 
we see those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life joining themselves with the Babylon beast. They are aligning themselves with this new world system and ignoring God. Revelation chapter 17, verse 17. For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Folks, a great part of America is now giving our country over to the beast, and it is prophecy being fulfilled. The following passage from Revelation describes America today. Revelation 18, verses 2 and 3. Babylon the Great, she has become the dwelling place for demons, a dungeon haunted by every unclean spirit, and a prison for every unclean and loathsome bird. For all the nations have drunk from the wine of her passion, of her sexual immorality, and the kings and political leaders of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth and economic power of her sensuous luxury. You see, Babylon is a system that ignores God and, yes, tries to be God. Our culture has become a dwelling place for demons, and the leaders of the earth are committing immorality with our wicked culture. Russia, China, and many others are getting rich from our resources. They're buying up our farmlands, and we're handing them money for goods and oil we could produce ourselves while walking on some of the richest farmland in the world with rich oil reserves under our feet. Scripture tells us that after these things, an angel will come down from the throne of God, having great authority, and his presence will illuminate the earth, and the angel will declare in a loud voice, in Revelation 18, verse 2, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. And another voice will be heard saying in Revelation 18, verse 4, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow, and I will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And then in Revelation 18, verses 21 and 22, Then a single powerful angel picked up a boulder like a great millstone and flung it into the sea, saying, With such violence will Babylon the great city be hurled down by the sudden spectacular judgment of God and will never again be found. Now folks, see in Holy Scriptures always means people groups and groups of people. Verse 22 of chapter 18 of Revelation, And the sound of harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will never again be heard in you, and no skilled artisan of any craft will ever again be found in you. And the sound of the millstone grinding grain will never again be heard in you. For commerce will no longer flourish, and normal life will cease. That's from the Amplified Bible. As we begin our study today, we should know that there are two groups in grave danger as we speak. The first is America because of her great sin. Our sin as a nation has caused God's covering to be removed. Second are those who do not have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, for time is short and they are in danger of losing their lives forever. The great perdition is upon us, and Satan is devouring people at every turn. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. And he deceives those unconverted ones who inhabit the earth into believing him because of the signs which he is given by Satan to perform in the presence of the first beast, 
telling those who inhabit the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded fatally by the sword and has come back to life. So in effect, with all the passages we just read, we've summarized our lesson for today. Because this lesson occurs just 37 days before Moses died and joined the great cloud of witnesses who are God's people in waiting. In this lesson, Moses summarized the life of Israel for the previous 40 years since God delivered them from Egypt, a journey that should have taken them only a few weeks. And there are two reasons that it took them 40 years, disobedience and unbelief. Unbelief means they did not trust God. It is the meaning of faith. Believing in something will not cause it to happen, only if God wills it in his plan. Oh, you can make whatever you are believing happen on your own without God, but it will not be blessed. We're going to learn that in today's lesson. But before we begin, we need to get a principle down. We in the West have been raised in a Greco-Roman, that's a Greek-Roman mindset, and this causes us to see things through that lens. Now let me give you an example. In our way of thinking, do we see God destroying the sinner in order to stop sin? The Greco-Roman mindset would say yes because it's how we view God in the Old Testament, an aggressive, strict, mean God whose answer to stopping sin is to destroy the sinner. And that is seeing God through the Greek lens because the Greek studies judgment. And the Greeks had 365 gods, one for every day of the week. But that does not match with God's character of long-suffering, him not willing that any should perish, and a God of love. It certainly does not fit the picture the Old Testament gives us of God's long-suffering tolerance of his chosen people. He delivered them from the bondage of Egypt and promised them a land of their own, a good land. At every turn, he took care of them, provided for them, fed them, nourished them, caused even their shoelaces not to wear out. Notwithstanding his provisions for them, every time they began doing well, they stopped trusting him and committed stupid acts of rebellion against him. They would get themselves into a jam and God would rescue them. They would repent and return to God's ways only to prosper again and then to rebel again. God's offer of prosperity is always on the table. But God would much rather the sinner would take his offer to prosper, obey him, and stop sinning. Let me be clear. America as a culture has, like ancient Israel, abandoned God. Our prayers for our country should be that rather than destroy ourselves, our culture would repent. That's teshuva in Hebrew, which means to return to its source, which is God, and we would stop the national sin. Such is Moses' last message to the Israelites that we study today. He summarizes the journey they've been on. He rebukes them for all the times they rebelled against God and admonishes them to go into the new land and obey God that they might enjoy it and prosper there. But the battle for righteousness is a long one. And we know that Moses died in 1404 B.C., And in 721 B.C., and remember we're counting backwards here up to the time of Christ, that was 683 years later, Israel failed again to trust God and the northern and southern tribes were defeated by their enemies and removed from the land of Israel. The southern tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi returned after 400 years, but the northern ten tribes are still in the nation's with God's promise of their return to the land in the last days. Israel became a nation again in 1948, and Judah, Benjamin, and Levi continue to migrate back to the land from all over the world. Some are going because they are called. Others, like the Ukrainian, Russian, and Ethiopian Jews, because of persecution. In Genesis 48, verse 5, Jacob grafted Ephraim and Manasseh as his own sons, although they were his grandsons, and he blessed Ephraim instead of the firstborn Manasseh, as was the custom. 
In Genesis 48, verse 19, Jacob said, speaking of Ephraim, But truly Manasseh's younger brother Ephraim shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Now equate that to Romans chapter 11, where Paul states that when we truly accept Yeshua as Lord, we are grafted into Israel. So we're grafted into Ephraim, the ten displaced tribes of Israel that are still in the nations. Therefore, all who love Christ and follow his commandments are grafted in and become a part of the family of Israel. We are now witnessing the preparation of the lost ten tribes because God is bringing them back to his Sabbath, his Torah, and his feast days. He is shining his light on Ephraim, which is why our assembly is named Ephraim's Light. After learning and observing his Sabbath and his feast days, Ephraim and Judah will be reunited. Read chapter 37 of Ezekiel, which we just read at the beginning. Read it again for yourself. Everything Yeshua said while on the earth came from the Old Testament because it is the source, God's will, and God's constitution for his kingdom. Deuteronomy is a special book because Yeshua, Jesus, quoted more from this book than from any other book of the Bible. As we learned last week, Yeshua is the gold of all that God teaches. That's in Matthew 5, verse 17. Deuteronomy is the story of God's selfless love for his people. So now we start in the first paragraph of Deuteronomy, and we find there that it's written in the second person, so we know that the introduction was added by someone other than Moses. And then we begin to read what Moses said. So as we read on, we learn that Moses addresses Israel, and he recounts their 40-year journey and experiences with God. As Israel prepares for their journey into Canaan, the burden has become too much for Moses because their numbers have grown and he is not going into the land with them. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, Moses said, And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. How can I alone bear your problems and burdens and your complaints? So choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among our tribes, and I will make them heads over you. So Moses blesses Israel and then instructs them to choose leaders for themselves and choose them well. He challenges them for their own good to choose men with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Now let's break those words down for a minute. The word knowledge that he uses is the Hebrew word benah, B-I-N-A-H, go Google it. It means knowledge of God. He used understanding, which is D-A-A-T-H, doth in Hebrew, meaning a soul with a fully developed path of righteousness of God. The word he used for wisdom is kokmah, C-H-O-K-H-M-A-H, meaning a high level of familiarity with the commandments of God. So these will be the elders who will carry Israel all the way down to the time of Judges and Ezra. Oh, America, if we could only choose our politicians according to these three things. But we haven't. We've elected some of the most unwise, unrighteous, and rebellious people against the commandments of God that we could possibly have. Our government is controlled by people who are liars, violators of God's covenant, proponents of sexual sin, murder, and the destruction of the family system that is so dear to God. These transgressors of God were elected by a people whose hearts are far from God, and we wonder why we're having so much trouble in our country. Americans' hearts must change. We have to return to our source, which is, in God we trust. 
Then with new hearts, we must elect people who fear God and keep his commandments. We must pray that the leaders in power will teshuva, return to God. We must pray that our culture will be convicted and return to the source of our blessings, a love for Yeshua and obedience to the commandments of God. When God instructed Moses to put a hand on Joshua and anoint him as his replacement, Moses placed two hands on him and leaned against him so Joshua would feel the enormity of the responsibility of the people's burdens being transferred to him. Teachers who God anoints feel a responsibility to lead people back to the ways of God, and I can tell you it's a heavy burden. It's always an uphill battle. Moses cited Israel's rebellion, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 37. And you complained in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Folks, this is Lashon Hara, L-A-S-H-O-N-H-A-R-A, which means the evil inclination. This is evil speech, which is harmful and damaging to the kingdom of God. Verse 28, where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakim there. So suggestive speech, folks, is powerful. Negative speech that discourages people from doing what God has instructed them to do is evil speech. Don't speak negative words that cause your brothers and sisters in the kingdom to fail. Verse 32, yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God. You let your fear of the Anakim giants in the land distract you from trusting God. That's having faith. Verse 31. In the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Of course, in all of these passages, Moses is referring to the sin of the spies in fearing the giants in Canaan more than God. Faith here is the Hebrew word emunah. Now listen to this. It means consistent faith. God wants us to live in consistent faith, not a hit or miss faith. Immunah comes from the same root word that we get amen from, and it means so be it. So amen shares the root also with iman, meaning to confirm. Add to iman the word hamin, H-A-E-M-E-E-N, And it means to trust or confide in. Folks, this is how we decode what the Bible is truly saying. So immunah is trusting God, confiding in God, and admonishing ourselves to yield always to the will of God. Then as we move through the first part of today's study, Moses begins to address the names of some of the places the Israelites have camped on their journey. Not all the places just the ones where something significant happened. Moses highlights the places where Israel was prone to sin, lose faith, grumble, and chase false gods. He brought up these places as a reminder to show why they had to wander in the desert for 40 years while their fathers died off, and as a reminder not to recommit the sins of their forefathers. Moses reminded them that they've been going in circles for 38 years and now he commands them to stop going in circles and head north towards the promised land. The cycle of sin in our lives, which is represented by the Israelites, circling the same area for 38 years, getting nowhere, it must be broken. God says, come out of her, my people. Romans 6 verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And God said in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 3, You've circled this mountain long enough. Turn northward. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 13, 
God said, now get going and cross the Vida Zered, which means the banks of the Euphrates. Moses reminds them that in addition to taking care of them, God has also been with them in battle. God has come through for them all the way. God is faithful to keep his promises. He is reminding them of the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 17 through 19, This day you are to cross over at Ar, the boundary of Moab. And when you come near the people of Ammon, do not harass them or meddle with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the descendants of Lot as a possession. There were three countries that God ordered Israel not to mess with. Moab, because the Moabites were descendants of Lot. Esau, because he is the twin brother of Jacob, Yaakov. And Ammon, because he was the son of Lot. Now this is what we should do as we edify and build one another up, and that is to remind each other of how God has provided for us and protected us in our battle with evil and of his promise to Abraham concerning our place in the land of Israel, which we will inherit. Moses is preparing Israel to take the land that God promised Abraham and live there in obedience to God. Moses knows that they must be under the covering of God to win the battles that they will face in Canaan. Deuteronomy 33, verse 12. The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Of course, in Isaiah, it speaks of Jesus when it says, and the government shall be on his shoulders. You'll also find that in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and Zechariah 14, verse 9. So this passage says, those who love God dwell in the government of God. We must listen to the lessons Moses gave because we are entering a time when we're facing serious spiritual and physical battles ahead before we're joined with Judah and return to the land of Israel. The warnings of Moses are timeless and appropriate for today. Every evangelist, pastor, and prophet of God is to remind the people that we're to look back at the mistakes of our ancestors and resolve not to recommit them. There is a group of people blessed and anointed by God called Ephraim, the first generation returning to the Torah. Hashem is preparing us for what is ahead by bringing us to observe his Sabbath, his feast days, which is called the Moedim, the appointed times of God. Many of us will return to the land of Israel, thereby causing it to expand its borders to the borders set by God in the Abrahamic covenant. All of this will be by the hand of God in fulfillment of his promise to Abraham all of those thousands of years ago. So in his dissertation, Moses then gave them the names of the countries who Israel, by the hand of God, defeated in battle. The Amaleks in their sneak attack at Rephidium, just after they crossed the Red Sea, Ered at Hormah, the Amorites and King Shehan at Jehaz, Bashan and their king Og at Indiri, and Midian with their leaders, Evi, Rakim, Zur, Hur, and Reba. These were the mighty men that the Israelite spies feared in their reconnoiter of Canaan just two years into their wilderness journey. Because of the sin of not trusting God, Israel had to spend another 38 years wandering around and around the region of Mount Seir until the generation of the spies died off. And you may remember the Mount Seir region, which is Jordan today, was given to Esau and his descendants, Therefore, Israel was forbidden from invading or capturing that territory. So Deuteronomy 2 verse 5 says, Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. God keeps his promises. Now, Israel was defeated once by Amalek and the Canaanites at Hormah, after God instructed them not to go into battle. 
This was after the spies lost their trust in God and then decided to attack the Canaanites without God's blessing. Moving without God is as big a problem as not moving when he instructs us to move. Either way, our job is to stay close to God and watch and listen for his instructions. 1 Peter 4 verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Folks, if Israel had gone into the land the first time, according to God's instructions, those who died in the desert would have had a much different life. But Israel lost its covering of God. We have to be in God's perfect timing, not ahead or behind. Then Israel went into the land without God's covering, and they were defeated. The Amori defeated them and chased them as they ran for their lives. Once out of harm's way, they went whimpering to God, and we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 45. But the Lord would not listen to your voice, nor pay attention to you. You know, if we're doing our own thing without God and we get licked soundly, don't even think about going and whimpering to God. He will not listen to us. Our suffering will be alone. We will bear the consequences of getting out from beneath the covering of God by ourselves. A lot of people find this out, and in their suffering, they teshuva and begin to serve God. Others never understand and remain bitter for the rest of their lives. Since throughout his speech to Israel, Moses refers a number of times and with different names to the giants in the land, let's look at their history. The giants are called Nephilim. The term Nephilim is sometimes translated as giants or taken to mean the fallen ones, and it's taken from the Hebrew word Nepal, N-A-P-H-A-L, meaning to fall. The most popular view of how they came about is that the angels were lured by the attraction of beautiful women and they gave up their estate, renounced God and came down and cohabitated with these women and their offspring became Gibborim, G-I-B-B-O-R-I-M, meaning mighty. The offspring, of course, were called Nephilim. Before the flood, it's recorded in Genesis 6, verses 4 through 8. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now this is the first mention of grace in the Bible. So this scripture indicates that God was grieved about the angels mixing with the women of the earth and the degeneration of the behavior of men in general. We see evidence of Nephilim on both sides of the flood. However, research shows us that before the flood, they could be up to 300 feet tall, but after the flood, they were only up to about 36 feet tall. The skeletons that have been unearthed across the world that we will discuss in a moment all had six fingers and six toes. Now, as an investigator, I have to ask this. If these men were up to 300 feet tall, unless they had the ability to change size, how would a two to 300 foot tall man have relations with a five foot five woman? To me, something is in doubt here. There has to be an explanation or the subjection does not hold water. However, no matter how they got here, we do know that these Nephilim existed because the spies in Moses' time saw them, and in 1577, a giant oak blew over in a windstorm in Canton of Lucerne and revealed a 19-foot, 6-inch complete skeleton of a man. In 1456, in France, they uncovered a complete skeleton of a 23-foot tall man. 
1613, in France, they found a 25-foot, 6-inch skeleton. In 650 B.C., it's recorded that an earthquake opened up the earth and revealed a 36-foot skeleton in the area of the Caucasus Mountains in Turkey. In addition, remains of Nephilim have been found from China, Peru, Greece, Israel, France, all the way to North America, having also been found in such states as Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So after the flood, there were several names for the Nephilim, mainly the Hebrew words E-M-I-M, Emim, Anakim, A-N-A-K-I-M, Raphaim, R-A-F-A-I-M, and Eloi, E-L-O-E, and you will find some of them used in the portion of Scripture that we study today that hopefully you have read. Now Moses' spies said in Numbers 13.33, There we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Although the physiological characteristics of the Nephilim are not specifically described in the Bible, they are generally pictured as being very proud, belligerent, sexually aggressive, prone to conflict, and even cannibalism. Immediately after they are first mentioned in Genesis, Scripture goes on to discuss how the heart and minds of the people became continually evil and God's flood was the cause and effect of their sin. So the appearance of the Nephilim and the degraining of mankind are linked. This was probably due to the fact that these giants were often appointed as leaders of the people. Now, wicked leaders draw out wicked people. And there's nowhere that this is more prevalent today than in Washington, D.C. The Bible indicates that the Nephilim reappeared after presumably being killed off in the flood. How could that have happened? It's recorded in non-biblical history that the wife of Ham, one of the sons of Noah, who was one of the individuals present on the ark, was born from Nephilim stock. She would, therefore, have passed her DNA to some of her children, especially to her son Canaan, and later descendants, so that individuals of large size and or psychopathic behavior could therefore reappear later in history. Moses, in Deuteronomy 3, verse 11, says that Og, king of Bashan, was the last survivor of the Nephilim in his country. And finally, God said in Deuteronomy 2, verses 24 and 25, Rise, Israel, take your journey and cross the river Arnon. Look, I have given into your hand Shehan, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Now Arnon is a river in western Jordan that flows down to the Dead Sea. Dread and fear will come to every nation that hears about Israel. People can see the blessings that God bestows upon his people so often they will do a preemptive strike against them because they're full of jealousy and hate. And that's the spirit of Amalek. Now let's talk about Amalek for a second. Remember Jacob bargained for and received Esau's birthright, which angered Esau? Esau was mad at himself but blamed his brother. He was mad enough to think about killing Jacob. So eventually Esau became content not to take Jacob's life, but he poisoned his children against Jacob. Through his son Elipes and his concubine named Timnah, Esau had a grandson named Amalek from which the Amalek nation came. When the Israelites traversed the Red Sea, Amalek attacked them when they were the most vulnerable. They attacked Israel from the rear, picking off the stragglers first, trying to destroy Israel, but instead, of course, they were defeated by Israel. Filled with hate for Israel, the spirit of Amalek has been a spirit to contend with through the centuries. The spirit of Amalek has risen in many generations since, and they are a cowardly group always waiting to catch Israel by surprise and off balance. 
We see this spirit in Haman who tried to eradicate the Jews in Persia in the story of Ruth. The Holocaust was the spirit of Amalek in Hitler. And this is the way Satan operates. He tries every day to get us to take our eyes off of God. He and his demons are full of sly distractions. They don't fight straight up, but are always lingering in the shadows of your life, waiting for an opportunity. Israel knows it's surrounded by people who want to annihilate them, so they never let their guard down. And this is what we're to do. Stay in the Word of God and never let our guard down. So don't let people point out your faults because they're just trying to get you inwardly focused, and if they do, they have been successful in taking your eyes off God. Whatever you focus on will change you into that likeness. So put on the Word of God. Get yourself into the Word of God. Tell the people that point out your faults to look at Yeshua because He is what we're in training to become. By putting people's eyes back on God and how He has taken care of them, fear is naturally eliminated. By recognizing God's faithfulness, our faith is strengthened. And all of God's people said, Amen. This is Pastor Frank Smith. We're in for some trying times and maybe even terrifying times. Know where you stand with God. Stand on His principles and you will weather the storm. He will be with those who obey Him as a byproduct of our love for Him. Be sure you are solid in your relationship with Him. Then do not doubt, do not fear, for all we have to do is to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Shalom.